America, it's time for some straight talk. You love your phone. Look at you. You hardly put it down. But you don't love that expensive wireless plan, do you? So what if I told you you can keep that phone, network, and number two for a lot less? Well, this is me telling you, it's time to switch to straight talk, guys. Bring your own phone and get unlimited plans starting at just 45 bucks a month on America's largest, most dependable 4G LTE networks. Straight talk wireless, only at Walmart. Savings may vary. Please refer always to the latest terms and conditions of service at straighttalk.com. Bart Scott, I'm Ian Fitzsimmons, in for Mike and Mike here on ESPN Radio, ESPN2, as we are presented in part by Progressive Insurance. And all guests, like Christian McCaffrey, Carolina Panthers running back, will be here coming up 9.30 Eastern time. will join us on the Shell Pinzoil performance line. Let's just get this over with. Bart, I've been hearing it all morning long. You gave it to me. The entire staff here has given it to me. Yes, I am in a tie. No, I don't have a court date. No, I'm not going to church today. <laughs> Tell you what, your casket shower right now, man. I, I'm digging it. But they told me, hey, uh, just dress down. I'm glad I, put, I didn't put on a T-shirt what I wanted to, man. I would have felt, felt awkward. I thought you were going to drop me like, right when you saw me. Wait a minute, what are you doing in a tie? Yeah, man, I felt like I was getting punked. I, I like, <laughs> really? Am I being hazed my first time on Mike and Mike? I'm no, being hazed? No, 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 no. I've so got, this is real. This I've, is- I've got Sports Center at, uh, right after the show, and I don't have enough time to change. Believe me, I would not like. I don't want to be in this. I feel I, I am not a Thai guy, but yes. So I, I don't have enough time to change. So therefore, I look like I have a court date. I'll give you a pass. Speeding I, ticket, right? I appreciate it, my friend. You are a big boxing guy, and I, I had no idea that you are like very, very, very into boxing. Uh, so we'll touch big time on Mayweather McGregor uh, coming up in, 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 a, in a bit because yesterday. What happened between these two guys was a train wreck. Now, quickly, first two days I thought was wildly entertaining. And this is all very scripted, and it's very wrestling-esque. But what happened yesterday at the Barclays Center was an absolute disaster. I mean, it was a debacle. It's over the top, man. It's it's really over the top. And really, the circus is really in town. But This is what the fans wanted. But this is a joke. I think it's laughable to even believe that. Conor McGregor has a chance to arguably be the best boxer and probably one of the top five greatest defensive boxers of all time. Man. This guy has talked his way into an opportunity to get the highest perch that he's ever had. You're talking about a guy that's not even defeated in his own sport. You know, and it's, I think it's highly disrespectful to think that he even has a chance. I'd rather put, put a bet on Vegas about how many times he's actually going to connect with against Floyd Mayweather. That's really the, the bet. I, I bet he doesn't land more than 50 punches. We'll get more into that coming up in, in just a bit. And, and again, uh, we'll also t- uh, talk to uh, one of our boxing experts in, uh, in Brian Custer from Showtime Boxing. He'll be here with us coming up at 7.05 Eastern time. Bomani Jones, 7.30 Eastern. And then Rudy Gay, uh, Spurs forward coming off that Achilles injury. He'll be here with us coming up in the 8 o'clock hour here on Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Right now, though, let's touch on some of the top other stories in sports and entertainment. Off the top. the top. Venus Williams is doing something that we have not seen since 1994. She wins in straight sets yesterday to advance to her ninth Wimbledon final, her first one since 2009. She is the second woman in the open era to advance to a Grand Slam final after turning 37. The other, Martina Navratilova, who lost in the 1994 Wimbledon final. What Venus is doing is remarkable. It's amazing. It's remarkable because usually we're used to seeing Serena in this spot. I don't know if we have to put an asterisk, but listen, you you only can beat who they put out there. I mean, at 37, I know how the body feels. For her to still be able to compete at a high level is amazing. Describe that. It's tough. What happens is it's not your ability to perform at a high level. It's your ability to recover. And what happens is you don't recover like you used to. So what happens is – you know, it, it just chips away at you. And the fact that she's able to play at a high level and, you know, it just speaks to her conditioning. It speaks to her nutrition. You know, you got to take everything to, a, to account, when, you know, when you get over 30. And you, but, and you had a good line in our pre-show meeting. Serena should send her an asterisk. Yeah. <laughs> if she wins, it goes, you know what I know. I'll beat you with the baby. <laughs> Doctor's orders, I can't do it. Off the top. The top. Roger Federer plays in his 12th Wimbledon semifinal today, breaking a tie with Jimmy Connors. For the most such appearances by a man in the open era, he's won 18 Grand Slam titles, 319 Grand Slam matches in his career. The other three semifinalists have combined for one Grand Slam title and 277 match wins. That's it compared to Fed. And at 35, he's doing, well, again, what you just described. Like, like you said, you know, I, Bernard Hopkins told me a long time ago, 
what's built lasts longer than what's born. You know, maybe it's been some some guys that are naturally more talented than the federal. But you know, you talk about a guy that's a professional, a guy that performed at a high level. It's just a testament to making sure that you do the little things. You know, great. You know, great players do the little things. You know, routine, and they make them look routine. And um, he should be applauded for it. And you know, he skips the French Open, so I mean, it may be a little thing that turned into a very big thing, giving his body rest and time to get ready for the grass surface of, of Wimbledon. And here he is. Another semifinal. I'm pulling for the guy. And you know what? In, in sports, I think a lot of times when we have greatness in front of us, like whether it's Michael Jordan, whether it's LeBron, whether, and you know where I'm going with this, Tiger Woods in, in his heyday, and Roger Federer, a lot of times I don't think we actually appreciate what we're watching until it's actually gone. Exactly. You know, you talk about tennis. A lot of people don't really – the casual fan really doesn't know how hard tennis really is. You wouldn't believe this, but I was a tennis player in high school. You know, not re- very good, what? but yeah, I was I was a tennis player, man. Not very good, but you know, I attempted to be one, and so sh- I can appreciate the short the shorts great. back then. No, no, you know, I had to I had to go uh, fat five style. <laughs> I had the long shorts. So you could tease me. Hey, by the way, th- this man right here, right here is big in the city of Detroit. We'll touch on all the things you've done for your high school and something that happened to your high school <laughs> that I still can't believe. We'll get into that coming up later on the program because you still. Give back to your community, and it's a remarkable thing. Hey, tales from the hood, right? That's coming up in just a bit. <laughs> Off the top. The top. The Cubbies traded for White Sox starter and pitcher Jose Quintana, the first trade between Chicago's teams since November of 2006. After leading the majors last year with a 296 ERA, the Cubs rotation is 17th right now with a 466 ERA, closer to last than first. And Quintana comes in. You know, it was remarkable last year. Slow start this year. He's been better of late. But this goes in the the direct opposite direction of what their general manager, Theo Epstein, said he was going to do. He said, hey, guys just have to play better. We're not making moves. Then he gives away his top two prospects and goes and gets a a very, very strong left-handed arm to solidify a rotation, which has been absolutely horrendous. But as a player... If you're in that room and you hear that message delivered by your general manager and then he goes and does something different, what's your reaction? Well, I appreciate it because that that means that the Cubs are going for it. You know, that means that, hey, yeah, we all have to play better, but we're going to give you some pieces. We understand. We identify that we're struggling right now. But, you know, we have opportunity. I think they have a, a, a very – windows in sports are very short. And when, you, when you're in the window, you have to take advantage of it, and you have to do whatever you, you can to win. You know, sometimes you mortgage the future for the present, but if you're talking about an opportunity to win a, you know, a world championship, you got to go for it, and you got to appreciate that as a player. Off the top. The top. The second half of the MLB season opens with Aaron Judge and the Yankees visiting Boston in a four-game set that culminates on Sunday night baseball, 8 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN, ESPN Radio. Judge is averaging a home run every other game against AL East opponents, and 40 of the Yankees' final 76 games are against divisional opponents. When you look at Aaron Judge, <laughs> could he play the end? DN tight end. You talk about a guy that's bigger than Gronkowski and the fact that he's able to, to get down and, and, and you talk about his strike zone, the, his ability to, 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 to hit the long ball. And what he did during the home run derby was, was amazing. I think it brings in the casual fan. It's exciting. I think, um, you know, the city of New York is excited, you know, post Jeter era. You know, he does everything the right way. He's electric, you know, but yet he's still kind at the same time. You know, Very humble. Humble. You, you got to appreciate that. But, yeah, he absolutely could play DN. Off the top. The top. Alonzo Ball recorded his second triple-double in four Vegas Summer League games to lead the Lakers into the quarterfinals in the last 15 years. Only four rookies have recorded multiple triple-doubles in a season. Three of them went on to win Rookie of the Year, and Michael Carter-Williams, Blake Griffin, Chris Paul in Summer League play. I, I I didn't. We had to double check this one. <laughs> one Stanzik's the one that told me it, and I so I'm not definitely not going to believe him. But I, I was shocked. In the history of summer league, there has never been a triple double ever in the ever. history of summer league play. He's got two. You talk about a guy with all around game. You talk about the era. I believe now the selfless player. You know, it's, it's cool. Uh, LeBron made it cool to get other players involved. And, you know, when you get everybody else involved, then it opens the floor for you as well. You know, you talk about a triple-double, you know, reminiscent of, of, of Magic Johnson, and I think he went to the perfect spot for his skill set. 
But was know, he in the Mambas? Was he in the Mambas though? It, no, he was in the Kobe's. Yeah, the Kobe's the first day, <laughs> and then he, and then he was in a, and then he was in D, uh, the Adidas Hardens last night. I guarantee you, Under Armour is coming in the next <laughs> game, and it's absolutely. I think it's genius, by Alonzo. To be kind of, he's it's almost like he's auditioning. Like, all right, who wants me? You need to come with you know, the Converse. You talk about Magic and Bird with the Converse. You know, Converse make a comeback. <laughs> and did you see what J.J. Watt did, though? So he came out oh. with his new cross-training Reebok shoe. Okay. His second one, the Watt, Watt the second. And it's I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't see the, I didn't see the first one, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually put out there on Twitter, for $400 less than another shoe on the market, you can have mine, and mine actually really works. Well, you know, Reebok it's just a pretty good shot by Watt. Reebok, Reebok, Reebok just doesn't get the cool factor right now. Right now, because of the, the popularity of uh, Kanye, you know, Adidas is making a comeback, and the bearded one is making them popular all over again. Off the top. The top. And that was off the top right here on Mike and Mike here on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Uh, Mike and Mike is presented by Progressive Insurance. More independent agents sell Progressive Insurance than any other brand. Find an agent at Progressive.com. Now that's Progressive. Uh, and, uh, one of the other big stories, obviously, is what happened yesterday with Mayweather and McGregor. And if you're just tuning in, Bart Scott here with, uh, uh, with me, Ian Fitzsimmons, and for Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. You are a diehard, not boxing fan. You, you, you consider yourself more of an aficionado. You're bringing up names that I've never heard of before. When... It, the first two days of this magical mystery tour between Mayweather and McGregor, this four-city and four-day publicity tour, which was, has been very scripted, and, it, and it's getting, all of a sudden, it started to get a little personal, well, a lot personal yeah. on day two in Toronto. In New York at the Barclays Center uh, yesterday or last night, they were two hours late. Fans had been there for a long, long time waiting on them to show up because the first two days were the very entertaining. Yes, and then yesterday – was an absolute disaster. I mean, it was a debacle. It was a train wreck. It got beyond personal. It was just a bunch of f bombs. I mean, it was, it, it it went the other direction. So, when you are watching it these first three days as a fan of hand to hand combat, what is your reaction? I mean, to me, it's totally disrespectful to even believe. You ever seen the movie The Great White Height? Oh, yeah. This is what I feel like I watch. I feel like I watch it. Uh, over Damon right. Wayne's. I, absolutely. Mr. Roper. I feel like I'm watching Mr. Roper all over again. I mean, Chasing the ice cream truck I mean, down this, the street with a cigarette. This, this, this is a joke right now. you know. And, and for people to even believe that McGregor has a shot is, 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 is entertaining to me. But I think it's going over the top. And I don't realize, I don't understand who's the heel. You know, I, I wrestled. You know, I got tapped out by Kurt Angle. I'm a huge wrestling fan as well. WWE sent me a uh, trash talking king belt. I have one in a trophy case. And when you have two opponents, somebody has to be the good guy. Somebody has to be the heel. The problem is both of these guys are the heel. And what happens is it just turns to white noise because everybody's trying to see who can have the bigger insult and who and who can insult the the, the other fighter the best. You know, the first two days, I think it was easily Mayweather was the heel and McGregor was just beloved. He's got chance going in Toronto. Yeah. It was 98% McGregor, 2% Mayweather. And then after yesterday, I completely agree with you. It, it, it is now it's 50-50. Yeah, it's like who who can irritate you the most? Like one one thing you have a real fighter, you have a real boxer versus I think a character, you know, a guy who the squeaky wheel gets the oil. For years, we listened to Ronda Rousey insult Floyd Mayweather, say she can beat him in a fight. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, her last two fights, you know, let you know that, you know, she's not that type of fighter. You know, if anybody's familiar with McGregor, and I know, you know, you have the, the UFC, the Miss Marks or Arts fans that, you know, are rooting for McGregor, but he doesn't have a chance in the hell. No. Listen, I, I think the over-under in Vegas should be, does he even land 50, you know, 50 blows against Floyd Mayweather? You talk about the greatest defensive fighter in the game. You know, you talk about Canelo Alvarez and, you know, his ability, what a great fighter he is. He couldn't touch Floyd. You talk about a young boxer in his prime. You know, McGregor's used to fighting with light gloves. You know, he's not even used to fighting with a bald fist. He's used to using his legs. It's going to be a train wreck, and I will not waste my money 
on this. And I, and I think it's a shame. Oh, because I am. It's a social event. Because, That's all it is. I mean, I'm getting together with the neighbors. You know, we're going to get go in the back house, turn all the TVs on. Well, I hope they're chipping uh, in. I oh, absolutely. They, okay, yes, yes. To waste $99 on something you can watch on YouTube or something like 10 I minutes later. In. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, and, and I think it's a shame because the boxing is experiencing a golden era right now. And I know you, you didn't really understand what I was saying. Post Mayweather – the best young fighters are calling each other out. You talk about Noah Spence that just went over um, to Cal Brooks um, hometown lost and, and beat him. It's like you lost him already. It is some great young stars right now. The division, the junior welterweight and welterweight division are loaded with young talent and they're saying, forget it. I want to fight the best. You know, this, boxing hasn't been this rich to me since Tommy Hearns, Aaron Pryor, Marvin, marvelous Marvin Hagler, Ray Leonard, and we're going to miss it because of the circus is in town. With Bart Scott, I'm Ian Fitzsimmons here on ESPN Radio, I ESPN totally Two, in one. from Mike and Mike. Man, I mean, I, you, I, it was like a glazed look over my <laughs> eyes, right? Like a couple, what, in the old age of boxing, did I miss something? Well, we're not missing this, and that's Mayweather and McGregor. And if you missed it yesterday, here's some of the highlights, or maybe more, more a better way to put it, lowlights exactly. of day three of the magical mystery tour that is Mayweather McGregor. I don't just smell victory. Until fake money b- He's bankrupt and you're about to be DJ Turn the music on for the strip I don't give a f- how hot it is outside I'm still wearing this now they almost right at the end what staged not staged you know and it is getting personal between these two but that was uh, brett okamoto who we had on yesterday our mma insider had a great tweet to sum up what you just heard and what you just saw he said, people love a circus until a freaking lion gets loose and starts eating <laughs> trapeze artists. That's what happened yesterday at the Barclay Center. Was that McGregor's pimp outfit, man? Like, did he stop on Broadway and get, like, hey, get me the Detroit player from the Himalayas outfit, man? Like, what was that, a cobra on the back of a mink? <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, you're killing me, Petey. You lost me with that one, man. One day, one day one day, he has the suit on, and he's Mr. Look at Floyd. He's a kid. He's dressed like a, like a teenager. Then the next day, he, he, he dresses like a pimp. <laughs> I, I can't. I, I look, man. What first, is that a bald eagle on his chest? What is that? The first two days, I loved. I mean, I thought it was hilarious. And, and, and yes, it, it's very WWE and very scripted. But, yeah, yeah yesterday – they lost me. And your old buddy, yeah. Sal Pal, he was there. What's Sal Pal doing covering MMA and, and boxing? Sal, I mean, come on, baby. Sal's everywhere. He man. is everywhere, Renaissance, man. Renaissance, man. He, he, can, he can multitask. Listen, I'm not even trying to be funny, um, but I think McGregor's going to get hurt. Um, hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Here's Sal Pal on what he saw in Brooklyn. Mayweather came out with the Irish flag draped over him and walked slowly off this, onto the stage and you could see McGregor seething. Uh, it was clearly personal for him that Mayweather had that Irish flag draped then over his shoulders and, and over his head. And McGregor had the crowd until he made some rather profane and obscene gestures to the crowd, gestures that I can't repeat on television and that we can't show on television. And then I think the crowd turned against him after that. Bar, this thing has gotten nasty. They have another one of these today in London. <laughs> and the one of the questions uh, that a lot of us were, at, were asking was, uh, are these four days of uh, these two just jawing at each other, is it going to be more entertaining than the actual fight? It absolutely is. And the first is. two days were yesterday hit a ditch the size of the Grand Canyon, which also now has me somewhat intrigued as to what in the world we are going to see coming up in London later on today. 
it's going to be it's going to be a, uh, a circus as well. But listen, mate, McGregor's going to get hurt, and I don't know. Realize if you guys remember when Floyd fought Gotti, and he punished him to the body. McGregor lacks the skills to defend himself in a boxing match against a precision puncher like Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, you can say he's not a knockout artist, but when it's no threat of danger. He's going to put on a show, and I, I don't even think Floyd messes around. He gets him out of there, and he proves a point for the next MMA fighter that thinks they can come over to a boxing match and disrespect you know, a, a real boxer. I always laugh at this because my favorite day in college as an athlete was walk-on day because all you hear walking around campus all day is how much you lift, how fast you run. You're listening to these dudes' guts and glory. And then they want to they, they disrespect you, something that you've done at a high level your entire life, earned the right to get a scholarship. And they think they can come out because they curled because they curl, you know, for two weeks and did some jumping jacks. They can come out and disrespect your profession. This is Floyd's profession. This is what he does for a living. I would be saying the same exact thing if they were in an MMA fight about Floyd Mayweather defending himself and getting hurt. This is going to be a joke. And I think, that, you know, that the promotional tour is going to be much more entertaining. Have you seen the workout video? I thought I was watching Apollo Creed. Gregors. Yeah, both of them. I thought I was watching um, uh, Apollo Creed versus, like, uh, Rocky Balboa. Like, he looked so slow. I thought I was watching Dial Up versus Vios, man. Like, this was the most – it was it was a joke. Like, listen, I boxed for the last seven years of my life. I can hit some pads perfectly. I'm looking at how he's throwing a punch, and that's a joke. I can hit the pass better than that. I tell you what, I'll I strip know down the walk ons on walk on day. That's what I wanted. Oh, I took <laughs> him. To, I, I, I took I took him to deep water, man. I punished him because it was disrespectful, man. And people always talk about you know guys crossing over to different sports. It's disrespectful to somebody that's performed at a high level. This isn't like he's calling out what's this guy Joe Horn, the guy that robbed Pacquiao last week. Right. You know what I mean? It's not like he's calling that Jeff guy. Jake, he couldn't beat Jeff Horn right now let alone the best boxer of this era, pound for pound. And I'm still going to buy it because it's, it's, a, so the big, it's a social event right before football. They, 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 better have some, they, they better have some great undercards because you will waste your time. You ever watch Mike Tyson fights back in the day? I remember sitting down and going to the refrigerator to get something to drink and came back and the fight was over with. That's, how, that's the taste that this is going to leave in your mouth. Home isn't just a place. It's a feeling. Whether you're at home, your business, or online, ADT helps keep you safe. With security systems, home automation, alarms, and surveillance. So you can feel at home, wherever you are. Go to ADT.com to get that feeling. ADT. Home. Safe. Home. Guys don't really talk about antiperspirant. Despite that, 91% of Dove Men Plus Care users recommend it. Here's what they said. It blocks the, you know, perspiration, I think is the fancy word. It's comfortable. Uh, <laughs> it smells nice. My girl likes the smell. Well, it's, it, I, I don't know, it's hard. I think it's quite masculine. Uh, my underarms aren't the worst thing at the gym. It's kind of like the Hoover Dam from my armpits, I guess. Dove Men Plus Care Antiperspirant. Tough on sweat, not on skin. Your old teammate, Tim Tebow. Hey, don't, you know, don't, don't, gloss, on radio. don't just gloss over that. Bart Scott's going that old baseball swing with your old teammate, 1-5, going yard in a walk-off home run as you now laugh. Timmy. Timmy time. Only Timmy can pull this off, man. God bless him, man. He, he means well. You, you just have to applaud him. He lives his life to his own beat. you know. And, and he's doing something that you know we laughed at first, and I laughed as well. Um but, you know, he's not doing bad. And, you know, it's hard to do. We watch Michael Jordan try and attempt to do something that he's done when he was in high school. And Timmy, you know, he's fairing himself. I don't think people was laughing as loud as before. Will he ever get up to the, to the majors and, and, and contribute? Probably not. No. But, listen, to dare to be great, you know, to be, to be able to have that type of skin, understanding the criticism that you're going to get, he has to be applauded for what he's attempted to do. Like you said, six bombs in high A. Uh, I, could, I couldn't hit That's six like bombs right in above high a. T-ball, right? Yeah. No, I'm messing with you. Listen, I, do, I know nothing about baseball, so I'm not going to disrespect right, you. We're asked to give out an MVP moment of the week. You know what? Because you're here, old teammate. Let's give it to Tebow going yard in a walk-off. The MVP moment of the week brought to you by Sport Clips. Get a double MVP at Sport Clips Haircuts for the price of an MVP. Hurry. That ends July 31st. Now, Richard Sherman, 
has been known to talk a lot. And he was asked at the ESPYs, for people who may have missed it yesterday, or, or on SB night, about all the billions, plural, two, over $2 billion has been given uh, by NBA owners and, and shelved out to NBA players in guaranteed money. Richard Sherman is set to make $40 million in guaranteed cash on his current contract. Mm-hmm. That would make him the 109th paid player in the NBA. Behind One, Eladova? <laughs> 111th in Major League Baseball. Uh, and he was asked about guaranteed contracts in the NFL, and do NFL players deserve more and longer contracts and with guaranteed cash? If, in case you missed it, here was his, a solution as to how NFL players would be able to get that very thing. As an NFL and as a union want to get anything done, then players got to be willing to strike. You know, I think that's the, the, the thing that guys need to 100% realize is you're going to have to miss games. You're going to have to lose some money if you're willing to make the point because that's how M- MLB and NBA got it done. They, they missed games. They struck. They, they, you know, flexed every bit of power they had, and it was awesome. It worked out for them. Now, we've seen former players. Like, like Terrence Knighton yep. uh, come out and say, hey, man, all the, looking at all the NBA money, Major League Baseball money, Stanton making $325 million in guarantee. He got hurt walking his doggy this morning. <laughs> He's still getting $325 yep. million. Dollars. You're a former pro bowler. You're in a, you're in, you played a, over a decade in the NFL. That makes some de- decent bread. Where do you stand when it comes to guys, former players, current players, wanting more money, more guaranteed cash, longer contracts? Well, first of all, let me say this. I believe Richard Sherman is absolutely right. Football players leave more of themselves on the field than I believe any other sport. With that being said, it will never happen. You talk about splitting the pie up 53 ways. Of course, football makes more money than any other sport, but you have to divide it up in more ways. You look at a guy like Carr, who's going to make $25 million this year. You know, you look at a guy like Kirk Cousins, who's going to make a lot of money this year. Unfortunately, you have a, a greater distance in classes in football than you have in any other sport, meaning that the guy that's coming in, the undrafted free agent like myself, like I was, James Harris, Wells Walker, they're going to make, you know, the minimum. And it's a huge disparity between the haves and have-nots in the NFL. And it's, it, unfortunately, he talks about striking. Richard Sherman, the rookie, wouldn't strike when he was making $500,000 or $300,000. That way, the owners are always going to have the power. And before, when we had the last strike, they wanted players to, to try and defer money, but owners won't allow you to defer money. Because if you can get paid over those, mo- over those months when you don't have a check coming in, how are you going to tell a guy not to cross the line when he has to pay the bills? And that's what happened in the last. You have 187. Yeah, you have. Well, no, no. Oh, you're talking about the, just, yeah, okay. Yeah. I got you. Because what happened is guys were calling DeMore Smith month one saying they needed money to pay their rent. They needed money to pay their, pay their gas. And when you have 10,000 heirs, 100,000 heirs, millionaires, Against billionaires, you're going to lose every time because what happens is guys are going to, they're, they're, they're going to wait them out. You know, they're going to wait them out. They're not, they can't afford to, to strike for months. Guys are showing up on off-season conditioning just so they can pay their rent. You know, you talk about going eight months without getting a check before, you know, the end of the season pretty much to September. Guys aren't that disciplined. I remember Ramon Foster from the Steelers saying last year, guys need to start saving up now. And for people listening on ESPN Radio, the look on your face was one of disgust and disdain, and it's never going to happen. You describe some of you because you're a financial consultant now. Yeah. Describe that that the life that NFL guys live, and when you heard Ramon Foster, the Steelers, say, "Man, you got to start being responsible with your money and saving." Your reaction was, yeah. well, "You know how hard it is to get 53." Listen, it's only about 15 people on the team making real money. Everybody else is pretty much living check to check. You know, you talk about, you know, people. And the thing about football players is, and and, and a lot of young athletes, is they're carrying the entire neighborhood. They're carrying their entire family with them. They have a lot of other people on the payroll. And and, and that's never going to change. And before, when we, we prepared for the lockout before, for two years, we took the, the, the royalty checks and saved them for guys. And guys still were broke in two years because everybody lives beyond their means. And it's a powerful thing. And that's why when, you know, you you mentioned I'm a financial consultant for Morgan Stanley. And I go all across the country. I've been to the Stillers. I've been to uh, UCLA. I've I've spoken to over 10,000 student athletes. 
right? And, the, and it starts with education. Until you start planting these seeds early at a, at a, you know, uh, a collegiate level, you're never going to change. They're never going to be able to go and fight for what they need to because guys are going to cross the line because they simply can't afford to pay their bills and things are going to get repoed. How much is it also that the life expectancy of an NFL career is only three and a half years, whereas the, the career, yeah. if, you're, if you're an average NBA player, you're going to play a lot longer than three and a half years. Therefore, you're going to get more in those guaranteed contracts. And what's the advantage for basketball players? They can go play overseas and get money. So they can wait it out that way. They can still get some t- form of income. It's no other league for, for NFL players to go play in. You can't say Canada, you know, because they only allow so many Americans over there to play in Canada. So the, the advantage for basketball or baseball is they got other leagues they can go play in and use their name recognition to get paid money to wait the owners out. And what happens is when you really want to come at the NFL, you have to come when the games are on the line. Right. But to do that, you got to be able to survive eight months and the typical player can't survive eight months. Yeah, and, and you guys don't get paid throughout the year. Eight months. Yeah. I mean, for people who don't know, you guys get paid from that last start of the check season, is February. And, and once the season's over with you, you are not receiving another check till yeah. camp begins. And owners won't allow you to defer your money because if you defer your money and try to get paid over a 12 month period, then what happens is you won't blow money as fast. Right. Because you have a check and you'll be able to not live beyond your means. But when you give somebody a check for three hundred thousand dollars, you know, and that thing gets sliced up, you're going to take the family on vacation. You're going to you know, you're going to fly first class. You're going to do those type of things. But if you deferred it, then people will save more money. But the owners won't allow the players to do that. Bottom line, Richard Sherman is right. Uh, The only way to get longer contracts and guaranteed money is to strike. But you'd have to miss almost an entire season. Yeah. in order to wait the owners out. Because the owners, as you mentioned, they are billionaires. Yeah. Uh, the best, the highest-paid NFL guys are millionaires. And th- those Bs are always going right. to, to yeah. win out. Easy for, like, easy for him to say now that he's going to, he has $40 million guaranteed. You know, but how do you say that to the, to the guy on practice squad that just had a, a baby who has to provide for his family? really put all his eggs in, in one basket and don't have the skill to go out and get a job to pay the bills that he committed to because he's dependent on his salary or his contract to pay for. You know, even if you buy a cheap car, a nice car, a decent car, you know, you're going to spend $12,000 right there. You know, you're in a different city. You're starting up life. I mean, Bed Bath & Beyond took most of my money at the beginning of my career <laughs> in Ikea. You know what I'm saying? Like, people don't realize you're balling on a budget when you're an NFL player. It's not until you get to that second or third contract that the majority of guys can really say, hey, I'm solid, I'm financially secure, and that's if you do everything right. With Bart Scott, I'm Ian Fitzsimmons, in for Mike and Mike here on ESPN Radio, ESPN2. I talked to Darren Woodson about this, three-time Super Bowl champion uh, with the Dallas Cowboys and one of our NFL insiders about this very thing. And he, he had something, he had a very similar answer to you that, that you had earlier off air in our pre-show meeting when you said you should learn to play basketball. If, if you have that kind of a beef right now, because you're still making really good lives. Or are, baseball. Are making, well, that's what that was his I can point. step in one his, like Roger Dorn, man. I'll take a couple <laughs> beans to the side of the head and the hip. Big reference. But what he said, because his son plays uh, baseball and football in high school. And when Stanton signed that contract for 325, I was on air, and he phoned into the hotline. And he said, would you repeat that figure that Stanton just signed? I said, $325 million guaranteed. He said, he gets hurt tomorrow. He yeah. still gets 325 I said, that's correct. <laughs> it, was, it was silence, and then Woodson says, I'm calling my son right now, and I'm telling him if he never puts a helmet on again, I'm good. Everybody, yeah, he's good. Play baseball. Play baseball. When they announced that, everybody in the hood was like, how much? Drop the ball. Like, forget that. <laughs> Somebody get me a glove. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Ooh, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm-hmm. <laughs> and shapes. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. With Bart Scott, I'm Ian Fitzsimmons here on ESPN Radio, ESPN2, in for Mike and Mike. Thanks for spending part of your morning with us. 
Calvin Johnson was over in Italy uh, promoting the game, uh, and he was asked about why he retired from the Detroit Lions. As we get now to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. Uh, full disclaimer, my brother is an assistant coach uh, for the Detroit Lions, so I'm slightly biased when it comes sorry, to – Sorry to hear that. No yeah. mess with you. Hey, it's good. It's good now. team last year, man. Come it's on, good now. Huh? It's good now. I'll mess with you. It's not the place that you used to be. Right? You're a Detroit guy. <laughs> I mean, he was bragging on you going, you got to talk to Bart about yeah, Mr. Detroit. We'll, no. we'll touch on that in a moment, uh, some of the great things that, that you're doing in your community. But Calvin Johnson uh, stunned me a little bit with this one. Uh, He was over uh, in Italy to present the game ball for the Italian Bowl, the American football championship game in in that country, and he was asked by reporters if he ever thought about going to another team besides the Lions. He said, quote, of course I thought about it. Just like in basketball, you know, guys, they create these super teams, but it's not quite like that in football where I had the freedom to just go. I was stuck in my contract with Detroit, and they told me they would not release my contract, so I would have to come back to them. I didn't see the chance for them to win a Super Bowl at the time, and for the work I was putting in, it wasn't worth my time to keep on beating my head against the wall and not going anywhere. That's the definition of insanity. Your reaction? I totally agree, and it's not the first time we saw this out of a Lions player. You know, I grew up, I'm from Detroit, of course, so I witnessed Barry Sanders deciding to walk away, another great player, you know, because they weren't committed to winning. And like I said, you leave a lot of yourself on the field. You walk away from this game, you're not the same. And you just That's something that we all sign up for, something that we understand. But what makes it worse is not having any chance of, of winning, or any chance of winning the Super Bowl. Now, I think about the Matt Millen years and him getting Mike Williams, Charles Rogers. You know, and what happened was that was an organization that wasn't ran correctly. I think since now I, I agree with Caldwell. I think he has a team going in the right direction. But, you know, you have to make a decision. He's made plenty of money. If he wanted to leave, he could have left if he didn't take the other contract and walked away for less money. And, listen, I'm from Detroit. The Lions called my agent and said, here's a blank check, Bart. And I said, no, thank you, because I was it's hard to prepare and to play hurt and to take painkillers and to go out and have surgeries or postpone surgeries when you're losing. Winning cures all. And there, you know, it was it was bleak. You know, talk about a team that was what, 0-16 or 1-15, you know, 0-16, I believe. And it's tough to go out there and put it on the line well, for that. Twice, though, in the, in the last three years under Jim Caldwell. So well, they have been well, better. It, well, it's, it's looking bright now, but at that point, the damage was already done. You and, know, and Calvin Johnson, when he stepped away, he was banged up. Yeah. I mean, he had the foot issue, the ankle issue. Uh, but I, I thought I was, it, it did raise my eyebrows a bit to hear him be that, that blunt about how he viewed Detroit. And, again, one year removed from retirement, they're a playoff team last year. You know, so – with him well, there, would they have been able to maybe move, move no. on further? Or some say Matthew Stafford has become a better quarterback of because he's not it's looking addition, for 81. It's addition by subtraction. And what happens is it forced Matthew Stafford to play the game and throw the ball where the, where the defense dictated that it had to go. And so now you saw his distribution go up. You saw guys – you know, he, I think he had – Five, three guys last year are over 50 catches. You, know, you talk about Tate, you, you know, you talk about Marvin Jones, and you got Ebron, who's a young guy. But it was addition by subtraction, but it was a lot put on Calvin because the organization struggled so much. They were always picking in the top five, and it wasn't an attractive place for free agents to come. Like I said, they told me, here's a blank check. And you're from there. And I said, no. How long ago was that? Thank you. This was 09 before I went to the Jets. The, the, you know, the Lions were there, and, and I'm sure they'll probably deny it now that I said this, but they said, here's a blank check. And I said, you know, no, thank you, because you, know, you want to have an opportunity to win. You know, when you go out and pay the price and you, 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 you're working out in the offseason, you know, you're having surgeries, it has to be worth it. And worth it isn't always money. You know, sometimes winning is, is, is what cures all, and it makes it worth it. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Want an easy way to see if you could save money on car insurance? GEICO gives you three. Call 1-800-947-AUTO. Go online to GEICO.com or stop by the GEICO office nearest you. Three ways you could save 15% or more. 
Good to have you here with us, as always, Bart. And for people who don't know, uh, and I didn't know this until I was talking to my younger brother, uh, Devin, who was an assistant coach for the Detroit Lions. The great Detroit Lions. He got that right. <laughs> and, and he asked me who was going to be in today because he knew Golick was out. And I told him you, and he said, man, you, you have to ask him about what he does in, in this community. I mean, he is huge. He c- continues to give back to his high school and this and that. So I went and looked it up. And, folks, this, this guy graduated from his high school back in 1998 and every year goes oh. back and speaks and every year gives money. And you've built a stadium. You've, built, you've, you've helped with a weight room. But you told me a story in our pre-show <laughs> meeting that I could not believe. It is funny and it's also <laughs> – just beyond tragic, disturbing and that. tragic. What happened when you donated and built bleachers for your football, for your high school football team? Well, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be from Detroit, Detroit Southeast. And I just left last week speaking at a, um, at a uh, flag football tournament. I usually get them uniforms every other year, but you know, they honored me by naming the stadium after myself. So I get a call from my mom and she says, baby, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, uh, what, what happened? Mom? What's going on? They stole the bleachers, baby. I'm like, what? I'm like, hold on, what? what? Like, they did what? Baby, we ain't got no bleachers. I said, what you mean we ain't got no bleachers? My boy? How do you? I just put those in. How right? do you lose bleachers? Someone stole the bleachers overnight. <laughs> do you know how talented? First of all, first of all, respect. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. I mean, do you know how talented? Awful. You know how talented you have to be to steal metal bleachers overnight? I don't know if they, they not I don't one know if they had, left. I don't not one. I don't know if they had their iPhone for light, but you can't have light. The stadium isn't lit up. They did this in the dark. If these people that use is their amazing. powers for good, that is the story of the hood. If they harness their power, you know how quick we can get some of these constructions. Send these guys to New York so we can get some of these jobs done. So I don't have to be in one lane for ten hours. Uh, amazing. Only in the hood, man. Tales from the hood. <laughs> I'm Facts. just trying to picture like, how many bleachers are we talking about? Are you talking about the entire a full, stadium? A full stadium. They got them all, man. Uh, overnight. Overnight. Again. They may be superheroes if they, <laughs> or supervillains. I don't know who did it. That's more like Lex Luthor, right? That's not, that's not hey, man, I thought McNeedle might have did it. You know what I mean? It had to be somebody that was familiar with metal. Oh, man. I, I, look, again, it's funny but also tragic. <laughs> I could not believe that that – well, that you taught that it happened overnight. Again, if these people use their powers for good, imagine what could happen. So I had right? to replace it with wooden bleachers, and I hope somebody don't get an idea to build a clubhouse. What'd they do with the bleachers? They sold them for scrap metal? Scrap metal. There you go. Okay. Joining us right now on the Shell Pennzoil performance line, he probably has a reaction to the story that you just told. You know him very well. Uh, as for people who don't know, uh, Brian Custer uh, is, joins us now, and Bart Scott is a boxing a fan. He's not a fan. He's an aficionado. This is and, the voice and, of boxing right now, by the way. And he's from Showtime Boxing. Brian, we appreciate your time. Um, d- the first two days of Mayweather McGregor and this promotional tour, uh, I was wildly and thoroughly entertained. Uh, and we all know a lot of this is probably scripted, but it was entertainment. Yesterday, it took a remarkable turn for the worse off that interstate. Describe what happened at the Barclays Center last night in New York. Well, first of all, they told me I'm coming on Mike and Mike, and they said Bart Scott is going to be on. I said, can't wait. <laughs> That's 10 cents. Can't wait. You didn't hear that at that all. That is my guy. Yes. What's up, my <laughs> dude? How you doing? He not only loves boxing. Man, I, I'm great. I love Bart because he not only loves boxing, he loves wrestling as well. So, listen, this press tour has been right up his alley. Uh, you, we started out in L.A. There was 11,000 people. Uh, L.A. was fun. Then we went to Toronto, and it went to a whole new level because they had upwards to nearly 17,000 people out. Drake came out. Uh, the crowd was phenomenal. And I have to give it to them. Their, the, the routines and the trash talk they threw was really entertaining in Toronto. But last night in Brooklyn, I, I, to me, it took more of a vulgar turn And both guys talked about how they were going to really turn it up because it was New York City. And we thought it was going to be great. I mean, when Connor came out with the Joe Namath, like, (laughs) white mink fur coat, we were like, okay, he's really going to take it to a new level. No shirt. 
And then Floyd came out wearing the Ireland flag. We were like, okay. But some of the stuff that came out of their mouth, uh, and McGregor obviously started it off, which is, I mean, downright vulgar. And you're like, oh, come on. Obviously, they, they, they've run out of stuff to say and routines to do because this is taking on a whole new level now. Well, I mean, you, in any great matchup, you have to have a heel. You have to have a villain. And I think at first – People, Mayweather was the villain, but now I think McGregor's kind of bounced over. They got to assume and get the right roles together. You know, I think boxing is really missing an opportunity because, you know, I believe boxing is having a rebirth. You talk about some of the great young talent in boxing right now, and this is going to be a big distraction away from some of the talented fighters. Noah Spence calling out two-time Keith Thurman. And, you know, I know a lot of people can't really understand that, but Triple G in his prime fighting Canelo, we ask for this. And I think right now boxing is making a mockery of itself by promoting this, this fight, which is great for entertainment, but not really great, I believe, for the sport. Well, listen, I, I hear what you're saying, Bart, and, and here's my take on it. I, I see this as really a one-off event, uh, you know, a spectacle unlike any other, uh, only because you, you don't have true, two true uh, members of the sweet science getting into the ring. I mean, you've got a guy who's probably the best striker in the MMA who's never had an amateur fight, uh, who somehow got licensed in Nevada <laughs> to fight a pro fight with pound-for-pound when he left the best fighter in the world. How does that happen? Well, it happens because, you know, Vegas and obviously that commission knew these are probably the only two guys that could generate that kind of money. That's why they're calling it a billion-dollar fight and bring that kind of money to Las Vegas. I think that's the reason why you have that. Now, will it hurt boxing? No. Uh, Will it help boxing? I don't think so. I think boxing is going to help itself by continuing to put on the matches that people want to see, some of the big-time fighters, as you pointed out. They want to see Errol Spence fight Keith one time Thurman and unify the welterweight division. They want to see Danny Garcia in the ring. They want to see the big-time matchups. Like I just think this is just one of those one-off events that won't hurt boxing. It's, I don't know if it's going to really help boxing. If the only thing it will help them do is they'll probably look at press conferences a lot different and say, you know, maybe we ought to bring a little theatric uh, to our press conferences because when you generate thousands of people to a press conference, it was crazy. When you look at the number of people who have come out, and, you know, they're going to London today, trust me, there will be upwards of 15,000 people in London at Wembley Arena today and I would say 14,999 of them will be for Conor McGregor. I think I've seen this movie before. I think Rocky II, Sylvester Stallone fought Thunderlips, <laughs> Hulk Hogan. So I think they're taking this right off a movie script. But with that being said, do you realistically think that Conor McGregor has a chance uh, of winning? And not only winning, do you think he has a chance of even representing himself in a proper manner. You talk about a guy who this is his first fight ever. By the way, that was Rocky Three. But oh, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry, wait. Don't, yeah. don't let facts get in the way of yeah. a good story. Yeah, don't, yeah. Do, don't ever come right. me again on that. My mama's watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. This is a guy who has a tremendous self-belief in him, in himself. Uh, he looked at this and said, and came out and said, I really believe I'm going to knock him out in four, within four rounds. And he said that because when he looked at Floyd, and he's even said this after one of the press conferences to me, you know, he's a lot smaller than I thought he was. Uh, his core is smaller, his head's smaller, his legs are smaller. There's no way. I know I'm the bigger man. I've got the longer reach. I'm obviously the most powerful puncher. He, and he's right on all of those aspects. Huh? Uh, the thing is, the, the thing is, though, here's the thing. He has never been in the ring with a true professional. And it's one thing that when you're striking MMA-wise, hey, you can strike, maybe get out of position, but the equalizer is your feet. So if, even if someone tries to counter, you can always come back with your feet. Man, if he gets out of position and tries to throw that big left hand, Oh boy, he's going to get the check hook. He's going to get the check hook. You know he's going to get the check hook. You know Floyd's going to be in there with the mongoose. I think this is going to be just like Floyd versus Gotti where he's going to punish him to the body. You see Canelo Alvarez, one of the best boxers, young fighters in the game, couldn't even hit Floyd. It wasn't that Floyd was hurting him. It's that every time he tried to get in position to hit Floyd, Floyd – 
hit him with the correct punch at the right time and threw his rhythm off. Now you talk about a guy yeah, who couldn't knock out Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz sat there and ate him, and now you're going to put on gloves, not the little gloves that they have in MMA. I believe the boxing gloves they're going to fight on. Is, ten ounce, and, ten and, ounce gloves. Right. The, 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 and, the, and, the contract, yeah, the contract for this fight is ten ounce gloves. Right, 10-ounce gloves. So you're just six, six more ounces than the gloves he's used to fighting in. You're talking about a fighter who, by witness, extreme fatigue in, in an MMA fight. Yeah, I know the rounds are longer, but Floyd's going to take this guy to deep water. He said four rounds because he knows he has to try and knock Floyd out, and he's going to walk right into one of those check hooks, and he's going to knock himself out on a ring post just like Ricky Hatton did by trying to be <laughs> overaggressive. And I'm going to watch it on replay because I will not spend my hard-earned money on a circus when I'm balling on a budget. <laughs> well, uh, I did that. Hey, hey, hey yeah. you, know, let, you can let Bart sell that narrative to you. Bart got money for uh, days and days and days. Oh, I know. Hey, man, my I family's know. listening, man. Stop. I don't want any, I don't want any more calls. <laughs> <laughs> He's never fallen on the butt. But, Ian, he, you know, he, he makes some astute points here. You know, the one thing about Conor McGregor, the best chance he's got is to really try to pressure Floyd uh, at all times in this fight. Um, and Floyd even said, you know, I'll probably take the first couple of rounds to try to you know, get his timing down, see what he has. But then after that, I'm going to try to punish him and back him up. You know, the one thing that, that, that concerns me with Conor McGregor, listen, I know he's in tremendous shape and always has been, but, you know, it's five minutes, three rounds. That's 15 minutes. You know, he's got to he's fight now here for 36 minutes. And if you remember the Nate Diaz fight, look, he gassed out. He gassed out towards the, the third round of that fight. He had really nothing left in the tank. So if he's going to apply all of that pressure and trying to knock Floyd out within the first four rounds, I just hope he doesn't gas out, and that's when Floyd can really take advantage of him. Now, granted, I know people are going to say, hey, look, we're getting the DSA. He also fought him at 170. That was part of the reason why. But it's one thing it's different when you've got to fight all 12 rounds. And I think that's the detriment for Conor McGregor. With Bart Scott, I'm Ian Fitzsimmons in for Mike and Mike here on ESPN Radio, ESPN2. Brian Custer of Showtime. Boxing is here with us on the Shell Penzoil performance line. Get instant gold status at Shell. Join the Fuel Rewards program now at fuelrewards.com slash gold. All right, Bart, uh, Buster, we've seen, I mean, uh, Brian, we've seen the first. Yeah, 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 exactly. Sleep deprived. Uh, The first three days, the first two entertaining uh, yesterday an absolute dumpster fire. What do you expect to see tonight in London? You know, um, I think it's going to be obviously a pro McGregor crowd. I think he's really going to play up to them. Uh, I think you'll see Floyd, and as, as Bart has talked about, he's embraced the role of the heel. He's done it a number of times, so he's going to do that. And, and trust me, I think you'll see uh, some antics kind of like uh, what he did last night with, you know, having the Ireland flag draped around him as he walks in and, and gets announced. You know, the, as you pointed out, the first two, some of this stuff was entertaining. I mean, if you're going to score the press conferences like a fight, I would call L.A. the first stop. That one was a 10-9 round before it Mayweather because you can tell Connor kind of didn't know what to do. He didn't know he had to come up and give a speech because he wasn't used to that. It was a different format than MMA. Uh, and then Toronto – was definitely 10-9 McGregor because, you know, McGregor had some great lines. Uh, he talked about how Floyd, the way he was dressed, you know, basically said he was dressed like a 16-year-old break dancer. Then he was like, what are you doing with that bag, a little schoolboy bag you can't even read? Yeah, he heard him uh, with that one. He heard him with the can't read one because yeah. if anybody <laughs> remember Floyd reading the teleprompter at the award show, it wasn't pretty. Right. <laughs> so some of that stuff, was, it was really words funny. Hurt. Words hurt, Brian. Right, they do hurt. But, you know, last night, I, I'm with you, Ian. I thought it was really vulgar because uh, we thought, all oh, they were going to be, you know, really entertaining. Now, the only thing I thought was somewhat entertaining was when Floyd looked at him and said, look at the way you're dressed today. You know, you, you, you look like a stripper. And he threw the money up, <laughs> made it you know, on the stage in front of him. That was kind of entertaining. But some of the stuff they both said, more vulgar. I think today these guys, look, they've gone through so many routines. I think if you're – 
Conor McGregor, you play to the crowd. You know the crowd is basically going to be yours. And you just say, hey, you just tell them how I'm going to knock this guy out. He's got nothing for me. And if you're Floyd Mayweather, you continue to do what you've done. And that's embrace the villain thing and embrace what he said. I, I've, I've been a champion for 21 years. I've never lost. This guy's tapped out, not once, not twice. He's going to tap out for the third time. You know, that's the type of thing that Floyd's been harking on with Conor McGregor. And I think you continue to beat that narrative to say, hey, look, he's quit before. I've never lost. I, th- I think Floyd should start planting those seeds about his conditioning and his fatigue. And, you know, one, th- one thing people can say about Floyd is maybe he doesn't throw a lot of punches and engage a lot, but I believe that he's always in tremendous shape. You talk about a guy that wasn't allowed to eat candy as a, as a child. And, you know, I think this is more about his legacy. And I don't know if I get do, – do you give Floyd – the real win for this, is it, does this make him 50 for him? Because we all know how important the number 50 is for Floyd. But I don't know if an asterisk should be around this one because I don't know if that really counts when you talk about him trying to tie the great Rocky Marciano. Yeah, I, I, listen, you know, I, I think the boxing purist w- would probably like to uh, argue and say something like that. Listen, uh, the way I, I see it is the Nevada commissioned it. I mean, so. But this you, is like fighting Glass Joe on Mike Tyson. This is like the first. You don't, you don't get a point for beating Glass Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo, folks, that's a Nintendo <laughs> reference going deep. Going deep here with Bart Scott. I, I think, Ian, yeah, I think uh, Connor may say more like Soda Pop Popinski or whatever. <laughs> I, uh, well, well, Brian, enjoy the circus as it goes overseas. And, look, I'm going to buy it. It's a social event. I'm not expecting much of a fight on August 26th. It's more of a you know, last big event before football season starts for me. So I'm in. I, I, I like the first two days. Yesterday was a debacle. We'll see what happens coming up over in London. Thank you so much for your time as always, Brian. Hey, I appreciate it. Tickets go on sale July 24th. There Let me go. hold something, man. He's getting them freaking flyer miles up. Yes, he is. Brian Custer from Showtime Boxing here on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. A reminder, tune in to an AL East rivalry on Sunday Night Baseball as the Red Sox hosts Aaron Judge and the Yankees presented by Ballpark Buns. Coverage of Sunday Night Baseball begins at 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio, ESPNRadio.com, and the ESPN app, and at 8 p.m. And at 8 p.m. on ESPN. Michael Wilbon and Frank Isola. Uh, had an interesting debate on this very thing after it was day two when, you know, you, as you mentioned, words hurt, and Conor McGregor got very personal with yeah. the you can't read and the, and the school bag comment. A lot of people deem that also uh, as racist, uh, a racist comment from Conor McGregor. Uh, but yeah. and this has gone – it's it's that's when it got nasty. Yesterday was just – Again, they were, it was, they were it was all just vulgar, and they went into and it went, they went into the sewer, is what yeah. they did at, at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Here's Wilbon and I solo on what they thought of, uh, about the first two days of this promotional tour, where a lot of this stuff is scripted, but some of it has gotten personal, and there's some animosity now between Mayweather and McGregor. Here's Wilbon and I solo. Frank, I have never rooted you for Floyd, leave. never, ever, once. But I want him to leave McGregor an unconscious, bloody <laughs> lump on the mat. Uh, what about you? Today's nice start of the day. Guess what? They got you. That's exactly what they want you to do. They want people who want to root to see Floyd Mayweather get beaten up. They want people to root to see Conor McGregor get beaten up. It's all a show. Floyd Mayweather's laughing at half the stuff that Conor McGregor says, especially the line where he says, you look like a little break dancer. You're 40 years old. Dress your age. That was one of the you know, more PG things that he said this is part of the fight game of course it's crass classless but so is boxing so is mma they're trying to attract more viewers to get more money and Don't guess what it. people are going to do it including michael wilbon because now Don't, you want to oh. see mcgregor get beaten up i'm in it's an event <laughs> it has gotten very very nasty at times disgusting yesterday uh, you're a boxing aficionado. You're not just a fan. You really follow the sport. You also follow wrestling. You follow MMA. You like hand-to-hand combat a ton. Your reaction to what I saw and Will Bond just said? Well, I mean, I think it will sell because I think you will, you'll start to d- divide the fan base. You know, I think they have an opportunity now when they go overseas, when they go to London, to split it. I think Floyd should come out with the American flag or he should come out with the Ireland flag again to kind of make it a Ireland versus United States and also make it, you know, you got to make it a black versus white thing because I think that's the biggest opportunity. You talk about, I believe, the the biggest grossing fight uh, for a while was Larry Holmes versus 
uh, I want to say Jerry Mayweather Holmes. Pacquiao. Uh, was, yeah, but was, before that, it was Larry Holmes, and it was basically, you know, Larry Holmes being disrespected by a white fighter. It was the basis of the movie for The Great White Hype, and it was one of the biggest. Randall Tex Cobb? I believe I, – I have to I have to do some little research. Um, I'll, I'll try and come as, back as with it. I think it was Jerry purist, Cooney. As, as a, oh, maybe yeah, it was Jerry Cooney. Jerry Cooney versus uh, Larry Holmes. But when you, as a boxing purist, are you pulling for Floyd just to knock him right? The you know what out? Well, I'm 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 rooting for Floyd simply because I feel it's disrespectful to be, believe that somebody can come to another sport and dominate arguably the greatest fighter ever in that sport. You know, I said it all the time, man. Shaquille O'Neal probably one of the biggest athletes ever. If he brought his big butt to a football field, I would chop him down like a piece of wood. <laughs> and I don't care what anybody says. It's disrespectful to think that he can come or somebody can come to my sport and dominate me with never having a professional match. Well, I've said this from, from the moment it, 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 that they were talking about doing this. This was Mayweather's last big payday. It's McGregor's only big payday. <laughs> right. That's the only reason that this is even happening. It's because all of these guys are going to make a heck of a lot of Dana money. Dana White off got him, Dana. Like me, idiots like myself that are going to purchase this thing because all the wives and the neighbors and everybody else can get together and have a big old social event. That's it. And all it's going to cost you is $99 plus food and drinks. And I will be taxing people that come in the door. Home isn't just a place. It's a feeling. Whether you're at home, your business, or online, ADT helps keep you safe. With security systems, home automation, alarms, and surveillance. So you can feel at home, wherever you are. Go to ADT.com to get that feeling. ADT. Home. Safe. Home. Guys don't really talk about antiperspirant. Despite that, 91% of Dove Men Plus Care users recommend it. Here's what they said. It blocks the, you know, perspiration, I think is the fancy word. It's comfortable. Uh, <laughs> it smells nice. My girl likes the smell. Well, it's, it, I, I don't know, it's hard. I think it's quite masculine. Uh, my underarms aren't the worst thing at the gym. It's kind of like the Hoover Dam from my armpits, I guess. Dove Men Plus Care Antiperspirant. Tough on sweat, not on skin. With Bart Scott, I'm Ian Fitzsimmons, in for Mike and Mike here on ESPN Radio, ESPN News, and joining us now on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line via Skype, Bo Monty Jones. Uh, Mr. Jones, I uh, greatly appreciate your time. As always, what were your thoughts on that debacle and dumpster fire that we saw yesterday at the Barclays Center between Mayweather and McGregor? I've been warning people for as long as they've been talking about this fight that this is the kind of clown show that it would be and the fact that they don't have an actual fight to sell, that all they're going to be able to do is turn this into some form of race baiting exhibition. And that's exactly what it is. Like, this is fighting. This is what happens in fighter promotions all the time. But it's so transparent. It's always been so transparent that it was going to happen here. And now they're just doing it because why else would anybody watch this fight? Like like I said before, man, this is just funny, man. This is f- fresh out of a um, Thunder Lips slash Rocky Balboa, Rocky Three script. Um, like you said before, I think that, you know, this is the best we're going to get. I hope they have some strong undercards because, you know, I think that, you know, if this is supposed to culminate the night, I don't think it's going to live up to expectations at all. No, I mean, well, no, I think it's going to live up to expectations because I don't think anybody expects anything. Like, it, I think it's like living down to expectation as much as anything else. Like, I think that people know, man. Like, you'll, you'll throw a fight party if you want to. you have some folks around. Y'all have, you'll have a good time off of this. You're just not going to get a fight worth a damn. Now, with your fight party, I would be very careful about who's on the invite list. But, I mean, it'll <laughs> give you a fight party. And, I, and I, Bomani, I said that exact same thing the moment they were talking about it. And then once it was official, I've been saying that exact thing. That is exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, August 26th, you know, before I start getting on airplanes every week to go cover college and pro football, I will have a big old party at my house. All the neighbors can come over. It's a social event. Open up the bar, have a bunch of food, and that's it. I'm not expecting abs- anything as far as an actual you know, but, competition between these two guys. None but, whatsoever. But McGregor is the pride of the MMA. These MMA guys, it's almost like a cult. They believe in this guy. They believe, oh, all he has to do is hit him with one punch. 
Well, 49 people thought that. And people don't give Floyd the credit for his chin that he has. So if he if he lands this great white height type of punch, Mr. Roper, Roper hit him with the right hand. Floyd has taken some 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 great shots from Zab Judah. Mosley caught him, and he stood up to both of them. He hasn't ever been knocked down or ever hurt in a fight. But Monty, do you no, think? This, 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 I mean, Go ahead. Why are we here? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are we here? <laughs> like, it would be different if there was like some equivalent to a catch fight between boxing and MMA that they come to the middle of. No, man, Floyd has all the leverage, and so Dana White and McGregor had to come into this farce and be like, hey, guy, you know that thing you do? How about you come over here and do something completely different against the greatest of his generation at this day? Who does that? I'm with you. Bomani Jones here with us from the right time with Bomani Jones on ESPN Radio. Congratulations, by the way, the right time. (laughs) Hey, Lonzo Ball Ball wears the purple Kobe's triple-double. A Harden Adidas triple-double. Uh, and I'm assuming Under Armour is coming up next. Now, your shoe game is ridiculous. Mine is very limited to about five pair of cowboy boots and some Chuck Taylors. Uh, but when you look at what Lonzo Ball is doing right now, what do you think, is it, what do you think the, the end game is with him wearing Nikes and then Adidas and then probably Under Armours and he still has the big baller brand out there? What do you think he's trying to do? I think somebody was a little late to recognize what we all do, that you're better off taking big shoe money early, getting some money in your pocket and building up some capital, and then trying to get your own thing going down the line. Like That's probably the way for you to go about it if you want to make the Triple B thing happen on the scale that they wanted to. So it seems to me that he's basically out here auditioning for these shoe companies to see who it is that uh, ultimately winds up giving him a deal. Uh, and it's working, by the way. Like, we can say whatever we want about him and his daddy. We're spending a lot of time paying attention to a dude who is good. But, I mean, we're not talking about, like, a LeBron James type of prospect where as soon as he walks into the league, everybody's got to see what's going on with him. That's not what we have here. We got one of about six or seven really good prospects out of this draft. But there's only one that we pay attention to all the way down to the shoes he wears. And I did think it was funny. And he's like, yeah, with Triple P, you can wear whatever you want. Well, what kind of branding is that that you're doing? We're like, yeah, I'm Triple B, but you know, the Nikes is fly too. That's not the answer. <laughs> well, what he's doing is, you know, you can't make the club in a tub, and I'm not going to trust my career to some experimental shoes. I remember when Under Armour first came out with the Click Clacks, and, you know, a Maryland based company, and they tried to sell that stuff to the Ravens, and they had the shoe that didn't have the full type of, uh, you know, soul, and they try to sell that whole thing. Like, listen, man, I'm not about to put my career on the line to sell your shoe unless you're writing me a check that's bigger than what the Lakers or what the Ravens are writing for me. So I think he's doing the right thing by going out and playing in different shoes. I think later down the line he gets his own division, and he maybe whoever, whoever he signs with takes on the big baller brand, and he kind of sells a portion of it and gets some license into it. That would be the smart play for him to do it that way. But, Dad, I'm yeah, not man. about to go out here and break my ankle with your triple B fake uh, uh, Alonzo mornings or some stuff like that, them heavy Ewings. Dude, that's the real, though, is that those are the experimental shoe because a lot of people, you know, believe that Grant Hill and his ankles, when it went bad, when signing with Eli, with Eli did not make basketball shoes. Like, I mean, that's a question that people have asked for a long time. I'd also like to know the NBA players tend to wear shoes once, maybe twice, and then throw them out. There aren't enough pairs of them Air Lonzos to do that. They don't exist <laughs> one at a time. And let me get your thoughts on uh, on the, what's going on with the Knicks. They put the Mellow deal on hold now. Do you believe this thing is going to happen with him now moving, or now there are reports that they want to see how they can make it work in New York? What do you think happens with Carmelo Anthony? Well, I don't think they can give him away. Like, I don't think they're in a situation where they're just going to be willing to take whatever trade somebody throws in front of them. So, in order to get him to Houston, I think a lot of things have to happen. And from what I've heard, it's going to take, like, maybe a fourth team because nobody actually wants Ryan Anderson. So, I will believe that he will be traded to the Rockets when it happens. Like, maybe they find a way to make a deal with the Cavs because he says he's willing to go there. But if I had to guess, He's going to be right back in New York City and game one, and everybody's going to be salty. What does Carmelo do for the Houston Rockets, especially if they have to give up Ryan Anderson, Gordon, and, and some of the depth that they've had? Does, does he make them a contender? Does, is that a big enough big three to be a threat to Golden State? Yeah, I think so, because one thing I looked at that I didn't realize was apparently when you look at the numbers or like catch and shoot, you know, quick shots like that, 
Melo comes up pretty high. Like, he's become a much better three-point shooter than people give him credit for being because they think about him as being an ISO guy taking these long twos. Like, he's actually adjusted pretty well to the evolution of the game. And if he winds up on that team with James Harden and Chris Paul and they say, hey, man, you just got to stand up there and wait for your shot, I honestly think he's willing to do it. Don't forget the most team success Carmelo Anthony has ever had was in 2009 with Denver when they went to the Western Conference Finals. And that year he only scored 22 points. He has played with Allen Iverson and J.R. Smith at the same time. Like, I think that he could, he could do well within that setup. I, my questions about Houston are all about what's going to happen the first time that Chris Paul cuts to James Harden now for not getting back on defense. Chris Paul is always in charge. How is that going to work out? But, but with that being said, how can Melo, you know, he's getting a little older. He, he's had the knee problems. Can he maintain that pace? Because he's at the age now where that body breaks down, and, and he's not a young a spring chicken anymore. Can he keep that pace? And what's his numbers going to look like being able to keep that pace? So that's a good question because, one, I think that, like, his – Offensive game will always be good, even as it physically declines, because it's that type of game. But you mentioned the pace and the fact that he ain't going to be able to guard anybody or can't really guard anybody. Uh, that's going to be an issue for a while. The other thing, too, um, he and Mike D'Antoni are going to have to sit down and have a <laughs> talk, aren't they? Absolutely. What had happened was he ran he ran D'Antoni out of New York. How do you kind of – uh, reunite. It, it, it didn't sound like D'Antoni was real enthusiastic about getting him. It, it's kind of sounded like he like, I'll coach him if I have to because I'm under contract, but I really don't want to. Yeah, we talked to D'Antoni about that uh, hey, earlier Bob. in the week. But I, I, but you know what? None of this matters about Houston if he ends up staying in New York City, as you mentioned, Bomani, because this, uh, that, that, this whole Rockets conversation could absolutely be moot if he ends up staying in New York. And word is that now that's what they're looking to do is keep Melo in New York City. Quick thought before we turn you loose, Bomani, on Richard Sherman, what he said at the ESPYs, how he, he's telling everybody in the NFL, if we want longer guaranteed contracts with guaranteed money, we have to strike. Your reaction? That's right. I mean, there's but so much. I mean, I think the notion of guaranteed money is a little bit overrated because the big old $30 million signing bonus is kind of like, act as a guarantee in practice. But he's right. If, if, if you want to get the money as high as it is in the NBA, you'll have to strike. My question to people is, how long do you think that strike is going to be? Like, you're on a roster of 53 people versus rosters with 15. Um, a sport that played 16 games, which is basically 16 checks from the television network, versus sports that play 80 and 160 games and everything else. Like, it's just not an apple-to-apple comparison in that way but if they want a serious increase in money yeah i think the players would wind up having to be willing to strike for a fairly decent you know period of time i don't think that the players will ever be able to strike for that long and i don't really judge them about the fact that they can't strike for that long these owners been rich forever a lot of these dudes just got rich 15 minutes ago they're not prepared to go a long way without a paycheck nobody listening to this damn show is prepared to go a long time without a paycheck i can't put them for it but if you're going to make this happen, you're going to need to go a long time without a pay. Check him out. The right time with Bomani Jones, 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, right here on ESPN Radio. Bomani, have a great weekend. Have a good show this afternoon. Talk to you soon. No problem, man. You guys be good. All right. Bomani Jones on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And that's something you mentioned earlier. You know, like people, the average you know, income for somebody here in the good old U.S. of A is $55,000. Right. But, and, and on via Twitter, People were coming at you going, man, the, the, the rookie minimum is 465000 How can you not make that work? And to your point was a 21-year-old just got $465,000. He has no idea how to manage $465,000, and he doesn't see the end game. He, doesn't, he thinks he's going to have that for the rest of his life. And when people say that, they don't know that they don't know. And, you know, greatest example of that is when lottery winners happen. You know, they don't understand. You understand the type of insurances that you need. You understand all the things that go into being a professional athlete, all the layers of protection you have to have, all the people that you have to pay within your team. And, you know, sometimes you can't really, you know, uh, you can't, can't really, you know, um, I don't know what to say. You, you can't really hold that against them that they don't know, you know, because they're not in that situation. When you get in that situation, you find out really quick that, you know, like I said, a million dollars isn't really a million dollars, and it goes fast. Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN News presented by Progressive Insurance. He's Bart Scott. I'm Ian Fitzsimmons. Coming up, Tom Brady and Drew Brees have both said they want to play well into their 40s, but what about Aaron Rodgers? Interesting comments from the Packers QB coming up next. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know... 
When you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Interesting conversation about Aaron Rodgers. Now, he said that he is on the back nine of his career. They're all, all the guys are out in Lake Tahoe where our man Charles Barkley will finish dead last, <laughs> as always. You know, he used to have a really good swing. I don't understand what happened to it, man. I know I, he has I, new hips. He, told he, has, this, he has a new hip, too. Yep. I, he told me the story. I won't say the guy's name, uh, the, the, the golf coach that told him to do this. Broke him. But he, I'll tell you off air. Um, he, you, you'll know him. He told him to pause at the top of his backswing <laughs> and, 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 and then come through. And that's where this awful hitch that could really damage people and hurt people came from. He, he really did have a great swing. He yeah, was a heck of a player. I'm and good. now, I mean, he, if, you're in the, in the, if you're watching and you're <laughs> in front painful. of him, it's you have a legit shot to be wearing a Titleist right in your forehead. I am convinced that that's why he needed hip surgery. Nothing to Isn't do that, with ba- nothing to do with basketball. It's that hitch, man. Swing. Man, he wore that. He wore that labor out, man. Oh, it's it's nasty. But anyway, all the guys are out there. Uh, Tony Romo, Aaron Rodgers, they're all out at Lake Tahoe for the for the uh, for the golf tournament. And Rodgers says he's on his back nine. He's thirty three years old. Tony Romo said, "Quote: I think Aaron is one of those guys who is uniquely talented. A special player in our league for a long time. He can go as long as he wants. If he stays injury free." He may be, in his eyes, on the back nine, but as long as he wants to continue to take hits, he'll be able to play until he's 45. Drew Brees has said he wants to play well into his 40s. Tom Brady has said he's going to play well into his 40s. How are these guys able to do this in this day and age in the NFL? Two, they're extremely talented, but like I said before, what's made lasts longer than what's born. So when you say what's born, Michael Vick was born. Um, Vince Young was born, guys that are extremely athletic. But these guys are self-made, and they were born with natural talent, but they continue to evolve with the game. And I think right now they're from the old school. You think about the new school type of athlete, these millennials. And I listen, this isn't me being that, hey, get off my lawn old guy, right? I'm not that old. I'm 36 years old. But – These guys are winning because they just think the game on a totally different level right now. And I think really what's what's hurting the NFL game is college because the college game is so much different from a professional game where I feel like these college coaches are pretty much playing Madden with real people because they do all the thinking for the athlete. What does a quarterback do when he goes to the line of scrimmage? He goes blue nine, seven, whatever his cadence are. And he stops and he looks to the sideline and somebody's holding up a, a board of a Twinkie and a hot dog. And that's the play. That's the play. So what happens is you have guys like Aaron Rodgers, guys, all the little things, their football acumen is so high that they think the game, and they're beating these guys with Jedi mind tricks. How many times do we see Peyton, uh, not Peyton, but Brady, Peyton used to do it all the time, Aaron Rodgers, catch guys loafing off the field, getting free plays. It's about the little things, the hard cadence, getting the safeties to show their blitzes, the things that young athletes don't realize, that if a safety's down close to a linebacker, that's an indication to the quarterback that a zone blitz is coming. All the little things. So, of course, these guys can play because Because the modern-day athlete is pretty dumb. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first-ever painting. Mm, All right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors Mm -hmm. (laughs) and shades. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how... If you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.